We now look at changing to polar coordinates can help us evaluate an integral that otherwise looks impossible. The integral we're interested in is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx. And if we think a, just a little bit about what it would take to evaluate this, we'd have to find the antiderivative of e to the negative x squared. But that is not expressible in terms of elementary functions. So we're pretty much at a standstill right at the start. We can't go anywhere with this. But we can if we think a little bit outside the box. <laughs> in other words, if we think outside the rectangular box and more in terms of a polar box. So let's see, how can we do this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this sort of non-trivial first step. I'm going to say instead of looking at evaluating the integral i, I'm going to look at evaluating its square. So that means I'd like to evaluate the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared dx and the product of it with itself. The integral from 0 to infinity e to the negative x squared dx. So that's the integral I'm going to look at computing. But in that second integral, I'm going to say, well, it makes no difference what I call this variable. I could call it y, for example because all I'm looking for is integrating it away anyway. So I just want that numerical value. So I can change the variable to a y. And this is the key step, because that means that I can write this as a double integral. It's the integral from 0 to infinity, 0 into infinity, e to the negative x squared minus y squared dx dy. So now I've got a double integral. And you might say, well, it doesn't look like you made anything simpler. It looks like you made it more complicated. Well, as soon as I switch perspective to polar coordinates, then I have made it simpler. So if we think about what this region looks like, in Cartesian coordinates, this region looks like this. This is x, this is y, and so our region is essentially this infinite region here. It's the first quadrant. But I could define this region in terms of polar coordinates by r is between 0 and, well, can go off to infinity, and theta is between 0 and pi by 2. And so if I switch to polar coordinates, this region, instead of being 0 to infinity, 0 to infinity for x and y, in terms of polar coordinates, r is going from 0 to infinity, but theta is trapped between two finite values. Okay, so that's nice for the limits of integration, but what about the actual integrand itself? Well, as soon as I switch to polar coordinates, it still becomes a double integral, but I've got e to the negative x squared minus y squared. I'm going to switch that to a plus and just put the parentheses around the whole thing because now I can see x squared plus y squared is r squared, so this becomes an e to the negative r squared and dx dy becomes an r dr d theta. So I get a dr d theta, and I get that extra r coming in for the change to polar coordinates, which I'll put out front there. And what does r range over? r ranges over 0 to infinity. Theta goes from 0 to pi by 2. So that switch to polar coordinates now gets me an integral I can actually compute. Because now, instead of evaluating e to the negative something squared, I've got the, so the uh, derivative of that something squared in front. I've got the r in there. So I can use a substitution here. Before I do that, though, I'm going to make another observation that I made in the previous example as well, is that this thing is completely independent of theta. There's no theta in the limits of integration, there's no theta in the integrand, so this is a constant relative to theta, which means I could split my integral up into the integral involving theta and then the integral involving r. And so this becomes that integral in terms of r. The integral in terms of theta, that just becomes pi by 2. The integral in terms of r, well, the antiderivative of r e to the negative r squared is e to the negative r squared, and then a negative half out front. And that's going from 0 to infinity. You can evaluate at the upper and lower limits of integration. 
essentially we're popping infinity in, but we really should be taking, you know, putting a t up there for where the infinity is, and then taking the limit as t goes to infinity. But that's all right. We've we've dealt with the the, the subtleties of this in the past. We know what's going on here. I'm gonna pop that infinity in. We get a zero. We pop that zero in. You get a minus of a minus a half, so you get a plus a half, and so this works out to be pi by four. What that tells us is i squared is pi by four. And so therefore, what this implies is that i is equal to root pi by two. And there we go. We have found the value of that integral. We were asked to verify it or prove it, and we have. We showed that the value of the integral was root pi by two. And we did it by stepping up the dimension switching to polar coordinates because that made it easier to work out. And so that's the power of the tools we're developing in Calculus 3 is they can help us go back and solve problems in lower dimensions if we can look at them in the right way. Power them up, put them in higher dimensions, deal with them there, and then uh, reinterpret the result for what they are in the lower dimensional case. All right, let's have a look at another example. Find the area bounded by the cardioid. Okay, this comes back to that first problem we did at the very start of this section. Find the area bounded by this cardioid. So that means we are looking for the area inside this polar curve. Looks something like this. 1 plus cos theta. That's r is equal to 1 plus cos theta. That's the region we're trying to find the area of. So far, nothing to do with calculus 3. This is really just a Calculus 2 problem, find the area inside a polar curve. But what we could do is we could reinterpret it in terms of a problem in Calculus 3. What is the area? The area is the integral, double integral, over this region of the constant function 1 dA. So that region I've called R, and we are just looking at the area of this region is precisely the double integral of the constant function 1. And so what can I do here? Well, I can work out what this integral is. To integrate over this region, I would integrate the constant function 1, and then it would be r dr d theta, because that would be the switch to polar coordinates, and that's what our area element is. And so what are our limits of integration? Well, r is going to go from 0 to 1 plus cos theta. Again, the way to think about it, this is just look at a radial line segment, and then it's going to sweep out over all of these angles. But the radial line segment goes from r equals 0 all the way out to r equals the point on the curve, and then let it sweep out the region. So, what angles is it sweeping over? It's sweeping over all the angles from 0 to 2 pi. So, there is our area expressed as a double integral. That first integral, the integral of r, becomes a 1 half r squared, and then it's evaluated at the limits of integration. If we plug in the upper and the lower limits of integration, we get 1 half 1 plus cos theta all squared d theta, and this is precisely where we would have started if we were to solve this problem in Calc 2. So this is where we start in Calc 2. So if we were to solve this problem in Calc 2, we would have started with this formula, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 half r squared d theta. But looking at it through calculus, uh, the calculus 3 lens, we start with this expression might be a much more natural expression to start with. The area is the integral over the region of the constant function 1. And then we switch to polar coordinates, and that gives us the r dr d theta, which then we see where the 1 half r squared is really coming from. So again, just looking at an old problem with new eyes, with new tools. And so we already, we computed this at the beginning of the lecture. So I'm not going to go through the calculation again. So beginning of this section. But I wanted to just show you that 
the formula that we had at the beginning of the section, we can see how we get it using the tools from this section, from Calculus 3. All right, let's have a look at the final problem of this section. Find the volume of the solid above the cone and below the sphere. So normally we're used to drawing the domains that we're integrating over and then the corresponding function that we're integrating, we don't. But in this case, we got to find the solid between the volume of the solid between two objects. So I'm going to have to sketch them. So I've got a cone. I'm going to put the cone in sort of yellow here. So we got a cone, something like this. And then on top of that cone, so we're finding uh, below the sphere and above the cone. So on top of that cone, we got this sort of spherical top. It's like an ice cream cone with a bunch of ice cream on top of it. And so it looks like this, where that green part is the sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. The yellow part's the cone, z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. And what I'd like to do is find the intersection. What is the intersection of these two? So let's for, look for intersection. So that's going to be where these things are equal. So we got x squared plus y squared plus z squared, but z squared can be written as an x squared plus y squared because the intersection we are noticing that we're trying to equate these things, so I'll use the fact that z is equal to square root of x, x squared plus y squared. So this is equal to 1. So this tells us that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 half. Or in other words, it's a circle of radius 1 over root 2. So that's what that blue circle is up in the diagram. We can bring it down below into the plane. So this is our circle of radius 1 over root 2. That's the region we are going to integrate over. So let's go ahead and redraw that region here. Look at it from a sort of top-down view. So there's our region we are integrating over. It's a radius of 1 over root 2. That's x and that's y. So if it's a radius 1 over root 2 disk that we are integrating over, then what we have is that theta is going from 0 to 2 pi, and r is going from 0 to 1 over root 2. So the region we are integrating over is a polar rectangle. So we're going to switch to polar coordinates. So switch to polar coordinates. So the original integral is the integral over this region, we'll call it d, the integral over this region d, of what are we integrating? So we're finding the volume between the two objects. So it's going to be the upper curve, which is uh, the square root of, or the upper surface, I should say, 1 minus x squared plus y squared, minus the lower surface, square root of x squared plus y squared, dA. So that's the thing we are integrating. It's the volume of the stuff under the sphere minus the stuff under the cone. That gets the stuff between the two surfaces. And so this, when we switch to polar coordinates, becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 1 over root 2, square root of 1 minus r squared, minus square root of r squared, which is just r, and then we get r dr d theta. And maybe I, I could simplify it a little bit right now. We keep using this observation over and over again, and it's good because this is, this is something that's going to occur quite a bit. So if I look at this integral, the innermost integral, no theta appears. So this is completely constant relative to theta. So that means I can do the theta integral on its own and multiply the result to this. The theta integral is the integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta. That's just 2 pi. So I can deal with that outer, outer integral. It's just that. The in, inner integral is r root 1 minus r squared minus r squared dr. So that's our inner integral.
Now we'll go ahead and compute the antiderivative. So this becomes a 1 minus r squared to the 3 halves. And I just want to see what number do I have to put out front to balance this out. So when I differentiate this, the 3 halves comes down, I get a negative 2r from the chain rule. And so to balance that off, to make sure I get out just a 1 times r in front of the square root, I need a negative 1 third there. And then I get a negative 1 third r cubed for the other antiderivative. And that goes from 0 to 1 over root 2. And so this becomes then, well, I can pull the negative one-thirds out front, so that becomes a negative 2 pi by 3. And then plugging in the 1 over root 2, so I get a 1 minus 1 half, so that's going to be a half to the power of 3 halves, so that's a 1 over 2 root 2. So that's the 1 over root 2 plugged into the first one. Then I'm also going to plug the 1 over root 2 into the second one. I've already moved the negative 1 third out front, so I just got a 1 over root 2 cubed. And so that's going to be plus another 1 over 2 root 2. And then subtract off the zeros plugged in. So when I plug the 0 in the first one, I have, I've already moved that negative 1 third out front, so I end up with just a negative 1 here, and then 0 into the second one is just 0. So there's our result. And now I get a negative 2 pi by 3. 1 over 2 root 2 plus 1 over 2 root 2 is just a 1 over root 2 minus 1. I can multiply through by that negative 2 again, so I get a pi by 3. The negative 2 multiplied in. I'll just switch the order because now the negative is on the other one. So that becomes a 2 minus 2 over root 2, or in other words, minus root 2. And there is our result. The volume of the region of this, maybe I'll say it this way, the amount of ice cream you get in your ice cream cone, where your cone is given by the expression in the question, and you're looking at your ice cream as sort of for forming a, a sphere around the origin uh, of radius 1, the amount of volume you get inside that cone up to the sphere, the top of that sphere, is pi by 3 times 2 minus root 2. All right, so that's it for this section. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time.